All right, yes, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm very excited to get this first joint community meeting webinar session uh, going because I think it's really the first time in my in my knowledge that that we are getting Joomla and WordPress and Typo3 and Drupal all together to do a presentation, uh, all four of us, which is absolutely incredible. So I'm, uh, first of all, really excited to be doing that, even though it's a very serious topic. Um, it's it's an exciting beginning. So thank you, uh, first of all, to, to Tim and Jessica and Matthias and Neil for um, participating in all of this uh, as uh, in representing your projects and collaborating um, on this initiative. So today we are going to be talking about the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, you may have seen the open letter that our uh, communities put out regarding the Cyber Resilience Act and how it might affect us and some of the issues that we see. So this webinar is intended just to go a little bit more in detail and uh, explain more clearly how it might affect our projects, how it might affect our communities and so on. So just to get us started, that's not it. How did this happen? <laughs> Sometimes Google Slides doesn't like me. There we go. So just to kick this off, um, these are four of the five people who will be speaking today. We have um, myself, my name is Crystal Dionysopoulos. I'm the president of Open Source Matters, uh, which is the organization that supports the Joomla project. We have Tim Doyle, who is representing Drupal Association. Matthias bolt -Lesniak, and I really hope I said that right, um, from the Typo3 Association. And Josefa Hayden Chomposi. Chomposi, yep. Close, I was close. Was um, uh, from the WordPress project. And we also have Kieran from Open Forum Europe to help us get through in the nitty gritty of the Cyber Resilience Act. So thank you all for joining us and for, for speaking. Uh, this is just a quick agenda. We are going to talk a little bit about our different projects, why we are working together, what is the Cyber Resilience Act, why it matters, and what's coming up next, and how you can get involved. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Tim so he can introduce the uh, Drupal project. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, yes, I'm Tim Doyle. I'm the CEO of the Drupal Association. Um, and many of you know Drupal, but if not, uh, we're an open source uh, CMS, uh, about 20 years old. Uh, the Drupal Association is a US not-for-profit um, that seeks to support Drupal the project and Drupal the community uh, globally. Um, we have, uh, I would say, uh, in the tens of thousands of members um, and most recently have been recognized as a digital public good. Um, our existing security measures, we, we go through this because this is fundamental to the rule. Um, we have a Drupal security team, which is made up of 30 of our members around the globe. Uh, they follow a, a discrete um, process when issues are flagged or resolving them. Um, and they use a standardized risk assessment, which is uh, based on a NIST framework. Um, so we have a pretty robust um, uh, security apparatus uh, that monitors uh, issues and uh, addresses them uh, discreetly. Uh, that's Drupal. Let me turn it over. Uh, next slide. I'm going to turn it over, I think, back to you, Crystal. Why does this keep happening? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. There we go. Okay, so the Joomla project is uh, forked from Mambo in 2005, which this year is 18 years ago. Joomla is going to be turning 18 in a couple of weeks, actually. So we're excited about that. You might wonder what Joomla means. It's an anglicized version of a Swahili word and also has similar words in many other languages. That means basically all together or as a whole, because the whole reason that Joomla started is 
uh, Open Source Matters, the project we were forked from was basically going closed source and the community did not like that. So Joomla was born and Open Source Matters as the organization that supports it was founded at the same time as a nonprofit organization in the United States. We are completely volunteer run. No one is paid to contribute to the project unless they're doing so um, privately. Uh, there are no staff for Open Source Matters and uh, we are still thriving after all this time. Uh, Joomla 5 is going to be released this October. As far as our existing security measures go, we are a registered certified numbering authority for common vulnerabilities. We really care about being transparent. Um, we also maintain a public list of vulnerable third-party extensions. So even if there's a third-party component that someone has installed and we are aware that there's something wrong, we let our, uh, our users know. We have the Joomla security strike team, which is dedicated to security with uh, very robust reporting and disclosure processes so that we can make sure that our process is secure and transparent as much as we can. And we also have built in support for multi factor authentication to log in and passwordless login, um, which is helpful to increase security CMS itself. So that's Joomla and I am going to pass it off to type 03. Oh my gosh, again, the, really? Right to the there we go. questions. <laughs> you just right to questions. To questions. Yeah, I introduced myself. And <laughs> we just assume just... everyone knows everything. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> All right, well, go ahead. So, um, Matthias Bortlesniak, I am a board member of the Type of 3 Association. And uh, Type of 3 is what we call an enterprise any size CMS, which means we have enterprise features, but any anyone can use them. Um, and uh, Type of 3 was started as a project by a Dane called Casper back in 1997. That's when he started writing the first lines of code. And the initial release was in 1998 and that's 25 years ago and i'm sitting here now the day before our developer day start and i'm actually wearing a t-shirt with the 25 year jubilee on it um, and the uh, the interesting thing with, with Type of 3, I guess, is that um, after a while, Casper pulled out of our project. He basically gave it to the community, and uh, the Type of 3 Association was founded in 2004 as an organization that should own the trademark of Type of 3 and coordinate and fund the long term development of uh, the CMS. Uh, and uh, today we have around about a thousand members um, and uh, the type of three association in 2016 uh, decided to found a subsidiary uh, company um, and uh, uh, well it's called type of three GmbH because it's in Germany uh, and it's a service company that provides services to to agencies it doesn't make websites or, or compete with agencies in any way but it uh, helps with marketing and the certifications and uh, also our extended long-term support plans um, and we released the version 12 earlier this year which will be supported until 2029 which we're kind of proud of um, and uh, that's actually one of our existing security measures is that we um, we have security patches for, for three years and then another paid three years with, with extended long-term support. We uh, have a security team that is the, funded by the Type of 3 Association and that handles everything that has to do with, uh, with security reports, both for the core and for uh, extensions. And um, we also have detailed security guidelines in our documentation. And we also have a bug bounty program. So if you go looking for bugs, you might actually get some uh, money for that. So uh, then we're on to WordPress, uh, Josefa. Hello, my friends. Um, so <clears throat> WordPress is also uh, has also reached a milestone this year. As many of us know, we have been celebrating our 20th birthday all year long and we will continue to do it because what use is a party for just one day? Uh, we, fork, we forked uh, eight 
uh, not 18 years ago, 20 years ago in May from B2 Cafe Log. And um, like every other project in here, we have a foundation. Ours is a registered 501c3 in the United States, but it has no paid staff. Um, and it actually is just there mostly to uh, own and operate our trademark uh, and do a bit of DEIB investment. It does not actually run the project as much as it feels like it should. Um, uh, the project as a whole is hosting its second women non-binary non and trans-led release uh, that starts like a week from today. And so we're very excited about it. Um, <clears throat> as far as our security measures go, um, we currently research and pack, patch our releases as far back as 3.7, which is 99.98% of the installations that we are aware of. It's a lot of installations. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we also train and educate about security best practices through our event series and also um, through the, the group of security researchers that work and, and kind of contribute with us. We have a bug bounty program that scales through the course of the release and we have uh, um, ethical disclosure requirements with those as well. We partner with two third party entities in our community that are CNA registered, and we host also um, an open communication channel with our hosting partners. So if they find things that are alarming, they can tell us. If we find things that we are about to need to patch, we can tell them and just minimize the strike zone as much as possible. Um, so those are all of our projects. And before we move on, I want to just um welcome everybody who joined since we started uh and before we get further into the heart of this conversation about the eu's upcoming cyber resilience act i did want to just stop and note uh, what crystal has already mentioned and what we have been seeing over in the chat here um that this is something that's really special happening here today we have leaders either named or elected from four major open source CMSs that account together for almost half of the sites that we find on the web. Um, and while our softwares are by certain definitions um, competitors, there are various things that we will always agree on. Uh, let's see, let's, yeah. So there are the basic facts of things that we agree on. We all agree on the importance of defending the GPL license. We agree on the ease of using PHP as our base language. We agree that our communities are sacred and worth every bit of investment we can make. Uh, and we all have been agreeing on this for like 25 years, between 18 and 25 years, forever and ever. Um, but there are also some philosophical things that we agree on. Um, we beyond the four freedoms. We all, of course, uh, agree on the four freedoms of open source, but we all function in a not-for-profit capacity, um, which means that we are reliant on corporate contributions to sustain us. And as we get into the definitions in the CRA, you'll understand why that is important for us to call out. We are also all volunteer driven. And finally, even though we all know that our uh, frameworks can power excellent enterprise solutions, we also see that our software is equalizers, like all of our software are equalizers for small businesses and solopreneurs across the world. And because of those commonalities, we are working together today as champions for open source on the web um, and for freedom on the web as well, and also for the continued success of our communities. So why is open source collaboration important and uh, you know this is really the first cross community meeting of Drupal, Joomla, Type of 3 and WordPress and that is I mean if you're here today you can tell your children about it and they can tell their children about it and and all of that but it is uh, you know it is something special uh, I don't think you would find this in in um other uh, communities that we can really get together um, on, on this level. Uh, but uh, truly, what we see very often uh, still is that uh, people see our CMSs as uh, competitors, and maybe they have sort of a sideways glance, and they look at the other one, and they say, oh, no, we keep away from those, or something happens over somewhere else, and uh, we uh, 
talk it down. We're very good in the open source community often of talking up our own projects, but talking down other projects. And uh, uh, however, we are really open source counted, for example, the uh, dependencies of the Drupal core and the type of three core and could and looked at uh, what uh, they had in common and actually uh, 66% of the Drupal core dependencies are the same as type of three has. So there is really a connection between uh, our different CMSs on a deeper level. Of course, we have different approaches to things, but I think we can all learn from each other. And when we haggle about who's actually best of the CMSs, I think there's one really important thing that we very often forget. And next slide, please. Um, and that is that looming above us, we have that very often talk about open source as one thing. If something goes wrong in one open source project, it doesn't have to be one of ours, even they can point at them and they can say, well, you see that happens in open source. And that's not true. We all know that, you know, security issues, for example, can happen anywhere, but we're actually open about them. We talk about them, we collaborate about them. Uh, a security fix in one system can be ported to other systems as well. And that means that when we work with open source, we have to work as one. Next slide, please. And that means that when we talk to clients and sell our CMSs, there are actually three levels that we can work on. And I think the first and most important choice that we have to focus on for our clients is actually that they choose open source. I think we're bringing ourselves into a very, very difficult competitive situation if we try to compete with, I think the really important choice that has to be made first by every client is that they choose open source because there are so many inherent benefits in just choosing open source. Then the next choice when a client has chosen open source is of course to look at what platforms there are in open source and finding the best platform. And in the end, and I think that's really where the strong competition is happening, is really choosing the agency, choosing the people with the best expertise to create the solution that is right for the client. And I think we can all agree about there is nothing good about a client going to open source and choosing the wrong platform or finding lack of expertise. So those are all things that we can collaborate on and get better at. Next slide. Totally agree. Thank you. Um, the next part is going to be about the Cyber Resilience Act. So I'm going to hand this off to Kieran. Hey, thanks. So just to briefly introduce myself, first, I'm, I'm very honored to be at this uh, momentous occasion. This is very, uh, I'm very lucky to be here. Um, my name is Kieran. I'm working in Brussels now for 20 years, uh, mostly on free software open source policy. I worked as a software developer before that, and then when uh, certain software patents regulation uh, came up, I, I moved to Brussels, and once I got into policy, I, I stayed. I'm working now for Open Forum Europe, who also has been working in Brussels uh, for 20 years, and we weren't working together for most of that time, but I'm, uh, we're working together now. And so in general, we work on policy topics, and we work on the, the very long-term uh, side of things, uh, trying to make sure that we get the people in the Parliament, Commission, Council to understand these topics uh, so that when they write something in the future, it will be of good quality. That doesn't always happen, though. Uh, and so the topic for today is this Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, I'm not going to go into kind of nerdy legal details uh, except for the first 30 seconds. So just if anyone wants to follow along uh, reading different parts of the text, uh, in general, what the Cyber Resilience Act does is it changes 
the concept of software being treated like literature, where you have the, the freedom to publish is a, a general freedom. And it changes that into software can be published if, and then we have to fulfill a list of obligations and take on a, a list of responsibilities if you want to publish software. Uh, so this, this this is created in the Article 5, and then the obligations are an obligation to produce documentation. There is an annex with obligations for what you do before you publish the software. So you have to review it and make sure it has zero exploitable vulnerabilities, for example, and obligations that you have to do after you publish the software, for example, provide five years of security updates and have a way to contact the users if necessary. So that, that's the, the legal text. I won't mention any more uh, articles. So what, what happens is the people who wrote the law seem to have had a, an idea that software is developed by a group of software developers, usually a company, and then when they decide to make a release, they pass the software on, possibly selling it uh, to uh, the users. And so it's a very simple model based on proprietary software where you have the distributor and the developers is the same entity. And it's a, it's a unified uh, entity and it makes releases uh, on a, based on a, a product plan. The way this doesn't then work with free and open source software is that we have a, a collection of developers who all put their, their software into a project and the project is then downloaded by a bunch of people who will distribute and then people, users get it from the distributor. So this is much more complex then because the obligations of the Cyber Resilience Act are triggered by supplying the software. And so then the first questions are, when a developer uploads the new module they've written to the project, have they supplied the module and do they have all these uh, obligations for just for having contributed to the, the project? So all this is hidden behind uh, the walls in a proprietary model and but because we do everything out in the open because we give transparency and we we allow collaboration and competition we end up getting extra worries about about obligations uh, so then the second error is that the obligations are put on the supplier with the thinking that the supplier is the person who knows the software the best and this was probably thought because if you look at the proprietary model the supplier is the developer because you have both entities are working under the same employer so but in in free and open source software the supplier is is rarely the developer and is, is almost never the developer of the entire software package so for for us this this becomes a lot more difficult and then we have uh, multiple companies and entities distributing the software and so once they have cra obligations we have to worry about how many times does a CRA audit and how many times the obligations have to be fulfilled. Because if we have 40 different companies in an ecosystem, then you know, does where, where a proprietary piece of software might need one CRA audit, do we need to do 40? We also tend to have more frequent releases as well, but that's, uh, that's, that's just an additional com uh, complication. So the reason this is uh, very serious is because the consequences for free and open source software are likely to be uh, first off, that people will worry about contributing to projects. And this could be individuals just worrying in general what their obligations might be. Uh, but also when you think about risk adverse entities, and I'm thinking about uh, SMEs, and even more so about public sector entities. If employees are currently fixing bugs, adding features, and upstreaming their patches, because why not? With the CRA, this will turn into something that they have to get approval from, from a higher up. And once you have to get approval, then becomes the question, well, why would we give approval or, or what's, what's in it for us to take on this risk? So there's, there's a risk that people will be afraid to, to contribute to projects. Then there's the, from the project side, any patch that they accept will go into their buyer package that they will then be distributing. And so then they have to take responsibility for anything that they're distributing. And so not only will people be nervous about contributing, but projects will be nervous about accepting external patches. And for us, this completely spoils the way we've always built our communities and our development models and the, the long tail, which fixes a lot of bugs and gives a lot of security review. So this is 
the, you know, these, these are the consequences of the CRA seemingly being written from a, a point of view looking only at proprietary software models. There is a paragraph about free and open source software. This is the recital 10. And this is, uh, well, it's somewhat useful. It's, it's, you know, we're, we're glad it's there. It shows that we, we were considered. Uh, but the, the wording is quite unclear. The, the wording in general is uh, surprising at first. Software is considered a product. A developer is considered a manufacturer or you know, possibly a supplier will be a manufacturer. Uh, so sometimes the wording isn't completely obvious the first time people see it. But the exemption applies to free and open source software distributed in sorry, outside the course of a commercial activity. And so the word commercial is always a source of uncertainty. We never know exactly at what point does a website that has ads or what point does an organization that accepts donations or what, what happens when somebody fixes a bug and then later receives a bug bounty. There are so many financial revenue models in, in free and open source software that, that this becomes very, very complicated. And once, once things get complicated, then because we, don't, we generally don't have legal counsel, we generally have to assume that, okay, if I'm not sure this exemption applies to me, I have to assume it doesn't apply. So this tends to make the exemption more or less uh, not get used. And so it may, it may as well not exist in that case. To the extent that it is clear, it's also very unfortunate that it only applies to non-commercial uh, software, because of course the software really grows when we can build up a business ecosystem. We don't rely on uh, the you know, students contributing their free time and weekend hackers. You know, the, the biggest, the most successful, the most useful software packages we have have multiple companies paying developers and hopefully making money off this software. So this, this, this exemption that exists, it doesn't really serve the purpose of protecting our communities and our, and our, our models in general. So when we look at the, the text, we, we've, we've spent a long time now talking to the, uh, the people in the Parliament Council and Commission. And when I say a long time, I mean six or seven months which is actually quite short for a legislative procedure. And this is unfortunate. The timing is such that in January, all the politicians have to go into election mode. So at the moment, they're rushing to get everything finished by, by December. So it, it's, uh, it's, actually being, it's actually moving quite quickly. When we, look, when we look at the text, though, we can see certain signs that could have been avoided had we been involved earlier in, in the process or had the process lasted longer. For example, the obligation that your software must not have any known exploitable vulnerabilities. In general, this, the definition of all of these individual words is not clear for everyone, but also we, we generally consider that this is possibly an impossible goal once you get beyond a certain size. There, there are then requirements such as your software has to have a default configuration that is secure which is also a difficult because we don't know where our software is going to be used. Particularly if you write a library, you never know if this compression algorithm is going to be used in a light bulb, in a nuclear power plant, in a school. And then when we look at the wording that talks about organization financing, uh, there, are, there is one exemption for, for nonprofits, but it only covers your nonprofit if you don't have recurring donations. And so here they've tried to avoid the situation where a nonprofit is set up as a way to, to launder the software. But the end result is anyone who's running a nonprofit here, if you want financial stability, which you do, you need to have recurring donations. It, this, this exemption will only apply to you if your nonprofit has not yet reached the status of being well run. Uh, then there's another piece of text, uh, which for me is my, is my favorite, is an exemption for foundations who make occasional supply. Now, anyone who has a software project and wants that to be hosted by a foundation who promises to make it available occasionally, well, I think they need to rethink their, 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 their idea. The idea of occasional supply, it, it's a legal instrument that exists so that nonprofits can have a fundraiser at the end of the year and sell some pens and some candles without being treated as a candle shop. But the thing is they've taken that and put in the word software instead of candles, and this is one of the things that's in there to help us. So this is what happens if we don't get involved. So we're involved now, we're, we're doing a lot of work, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's 
quite complicated, but we are getting a lot of time with the policymakers, which is the good thing. That's my con that's my presentation of the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure there'll be quite a questions. Uh, a brief note on the status is that the the Parliament um, the, the Commission writes the original text. They hand it to the Parliament and the Council. I won't go into the details. They've finished their work. So now that we have three entities that have texts, the Council, the Parliament, and the Commission, uh, one person from each of these entities will now be nominated to uh, go into trilogues. And so they'll try and merge the three texts. The three, the three texts are very different. So the, the final outcome will not resemble any of the, any of the individual texts, uh, which also means that there's a lot of freedom for anything to be changed, really, uh, which uh, could be to our advantage, but it's also something we have to be concerned about because, yeah, things can go can go wrong as well. Uh, so there is still, everything is still open, and there is still plenty of work to do, but it has, you know, it, it is going to finish in uh, probably by the end of November, and so we've got a lot of work to do, uh, particularly to be ready for September, we're going to try to put together a, a big policy document of 20, 30 pages, giving lots of examples. If we can get some of the CMS examples, that would be fantastic. And we need to show them how our software gets written, how it gets financed, and how it should be protected, and how we can increase cybersecurity. Because if we want them to help us, we have to make sure we're actually accepting a few obligations, and well, as many as possible, really, uh, to, to increase cybersecurity. And so this is the, the complex tasks that we're working on at the moment. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to staying in contact and, and working on it together. Karen, you know, thank you so much for not only for this presentation, but also for the work that you've been doing and Open Forum Europe has been doing to convene open source and advocate for open source. One of the goals, if we go to the next slide, I just want to review, I'm going to see a little redundant what Karen said, but just the three priorities uh, are, are um, the biggest problems that we have with the regulation. But really the purpose of this webinar is to build awareness among our communities about the rule and what is going on. Um, primarily because, at least in my opinion, one thing open source doesn't do well is advocate for itself outside of its own community. Uh, we, have a, we all have collectively very strong communities, uh, very principled communities, and yet we have uh, folks outside the community not quite understanding uh, how open source operates and, and writing rules that, that doesn't reflect um, and doesn't really support the principles. So that's really the purpose of this webinar. Um, this discussion has been, this rule has been out since September, here went through the, the, the process open forum has done. Uh, we are a little bit late, uh, but not too late. As Karen said, there's, they're, they're writing this final rule. The other purpose or goal of building new awareness is that, um, uh, I think we, the four uh, groups on this call, came to the realization that uh, we need to start advocating for ourselves to uh, legislatures in Europe, in the US, where, wherever we need to, uh, because if they don't have a correct understanding of open source, there's a, there can be a contagion of lack of understanding that moves to other, uh, other regulatory bodies. Uh, and this is, this is one rule. There are other rules coming down, uh, down the road that we need to uh, ensure that they treat open source correctly. Our three main concerns with this rule uh, is the definition of commercial activity is unclear and potentially problematic. You did a great job talking about the different ways that uh, either official not-for-profits or volunteers can, um, can, uh, can receive something of value that could be construed as commercial activity. Um, we have the, the, the flaws of the, in the notion of unfinished software. Uh, the rule only accepts unfinished software if it's only deployed for the purposes of um, testing and not available to market. And, and, and most folks know this better than myself even, um, this idea kind of goes against the idea uh, of, of agile software development, uh, minimum viable product, um, deploying to get many eyes on, um, uh, to get feedback, et cetera. And then lastly, the legal responsibility uh, and um, that open source products, um, the nature of open source products are not accounted for in the legal responsibility, le legal accountability that the rule is placing. Um, my understanding is that it's, it's falling back to an older kind of manufacturing product model of liability. And it says, if you make, you know, 
that whoever makes the software is responsible for it in, in terms of a manufacturer. I mean, as we know in open source, uh, there, there can be many manufacturers of the, of the software uh, and not just one. Um, these are our primary concerns. There are others. Um, we are uh, engaged with Open Forum um, Europe and, at, and will be, you know, part of their processes as, um, and support them as, and give our input uh, as, we, um, uh, as, they, as we write the policy paper. You go to the next slide. Um, just want to go over kind of the high level. Uh, some people have asked, you know, why are we holding this webinar? Uh, it's to build awareness and the impact of the rule on open source projects. And the folks on this call, come, we all have different models of how we support open source, either from a, a, a formal not-for-profit with paid staff to completely volunteer models. Um, all of those models are affected by this. Um, it can affect contributors, um, whether you're volunteer, paid, or sponsored. Um, it, it, under this rule, contributions may uh, become more complicated. Um, you know, it, there's no certainty in this, but I think where we need to advocate is to ensure that the rule is written um, clearly so that so uh, open source is not adversely affected and can continue to be uh, fundamental to um, software and, and the web in Europe. Uh, and then lastly, our broader our broader communities can be um, affected, whether you work for a large company or a small company or, or work by yourself. Um, there may be compliance requirements that this rule is placing on you that that um, will be quite burdensome. Uh, so we have a letter. We will be distributing this um, uh, this recorded webinar and continuing our advocacy efforts. Let me let's switch. Uh, I think it goes over to you, Crystal, to talk about next steps. And I would encourage yep. people if you have questions, put the questions in the Q and A. That's where we'll try to answer them. If we have good answers, we'll put them in as we have them. Um, and we will be conferring if, if we need to think more about them. But Crystal, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Tim. Yes, so our next steps, because the letter was just the beginning, we are going to continue collaborating with each other and with the broader um, open source community like Open Forum Europe, um, as well as hopefully directly with EU legislators, because as uh, Kieran mentioned, open source is going to be included one way or another. So the best way to minimize the negative impact is to work with them constructively and give them ways that we can comply, even if it's stuff that we're already doing. So we're going to help um, offer open source first language or wording or best practices that we're that we are able to include without um, being too burdensome. Um, which will hopefully influence the final wording of the act to be a little bit more um, distinct between proprietary and open source software. We're also working on organizing a seminar in Brussels uh, in person. Uh, we're hoping to discuss with legislators about open source because it seems that the people who drafted this um, didn't necessarily have an understanding, at least until after they started getting feedback, um, on the nuances of open source software and how many different kinds of ways that can play out in a community. Um, even if that seminar is a little bit too late to directly influence the CRA, I'm hoping that it will also help them understand open source for the future too, because I, there are going to be more things coming down that that might influence open source. And so um, it would be helpful for them to have a better understanding right from the start. The details of that are going to be announced as we figure them out, but likely it's going to take place in September or October. But we're not just going to stop with the Cyber Resilience Act. It also goes beyond that. So we're going to continue working together as open source CMSs. Um, we are going to have to address other legislation around the world, possibly as a group. In the future, um, there are similar acts coming up in the US and in other places around the world. There is also other legislation from the EU which could impact um, open source software that uh, is not just about security, but is about digital products and things like that, if I remember correctly. And I'm sure that there is going to be more coming through also. So we are going to continue working together on things like this and collaborating and um, perhaps including other open source CMS communities as well uh, in that collaboration because uh, we are stronger working together. I, I, the four, uh, Josefa mentioned at the beginning that the, the four communities are represented here. Um, 
represent basically half of the websites that are running on the web, which is a lot. That's incredible. Um, so we are, by combining our communities, we can combine our expertise, we can combine our reach and create more change that benefits all of us uh, as, as an open source community, which is really cool and exciting. I get really excited about that. Um, and we're also open uh, promoting open source software overall because it's not just about open source CMSs, it's about open source in general, open source matters. We, we, we care about the open source community because it's, uh, we all share the same values and intentions. So let's get into how you can help now if you're here. All right, so firstly, I'm going to rock it through this so we have like 15 minutes for questions. First thing is you might be hearing about this for the first time and you might find all of this alarming. Don't find it alarming, don't panic, but do take that feeling of like, oh no, we should be doing something and join us in in this next set of things that we've we're going to ask you to do. So number 1, we would like you all to help us spread the word into your communities. You can reshare the letter that we wrote. Um there will be a recording of this that you all are welcome to share anywhere that is uh helpful. Uh make sure that the stakeholders in your local communities are aware of what this is and why it matters and of course why open source matters. Another thing that we ask you to do even if you're not going to spread the word is stay up to date with us. So there are some upcoming opportunities for you to collaborate with your projects with us here um, to voice your concerns and help us collect information. We have been asked to collect some information about um, all of the things that would be in line or not in line with the various definitions that we are having concerns about. And so we're going to send out um, uh, some information to ask you to, to get that collaborative knowledge better together. And then in general, just engage in this conversation with us. Um, like I said, talk about the values and benefits of open source in your local communities. Um, and that survey, I know that it was shared in the chat already once. If someone wants to share it with everyone in the chat again, that would be great. But also um, we will just have it go out from um, all of our projects. Uh, it asks questions about uh, plugins, themes, uh, extensions, all those things, just to get a sense for products uh, in our ecosystems. And then also, if you all in your products, in your small open source communities, whatever it is, have above and beyond measures that you take for security that look like they could be scalable, absolutely let us know. Because that is one of the main concerns of the CRA that we, of course, are immediately trying to to uh, make clear about how we manage things. And so those are the three big ways that you can help immediately. I know it does not say contact your PM, contact your MEP, um, but that is probably a thing we will ask for at some point uh, as we go through it. Done. Time for questions. I took twice as long as I was going to take. Uh, that was good. No, you did that good. Um, we, have, we have a we have a bunch of questions in the chat. I was just going to pull out some maybe for quick um, answers. Uh, Kieran, yeah. since you're kind of have been doing the most work on this, one question: Has proprietary software industry made comments on the rule? Do you have any insight into that? Uh, not as much as we were expecting. So we kind of focused on the recital ten exemption for free and open source software because we thought the requirements that generally apply to software they're going to annoy a large swath of proprietary software companies and you know they, they should work on that and hopefully they'll make that kind of reasonable for everyone. We're surprised how little changed and so I'm not sure if they didn't pay enough attention, if they just didn't manage to convince or it could be that a lot of the proprietary software lobbies in Europe are mostly financed by non-European software companies and it's possible that Either they're not interested in fixing the CRA all that much, or maybe the EU policy makers were not interested in listening to uh, entities um, funded by US software companies. Uh, so it, it appears that they haven't done as much as we were expecting at all. Thank you. And then we had another question about uh, you meant, and you covered the definition of commercial, the inclusion of the 
word commercial activity in the rule and, and some of the concerns with that. Do you know specifically why they included that? What were they? What loophole were they trying to close by including commercial activity um, in, I guess, it's section ten or wherever? Yeah, they they have a, a guide, a terminology guide called the Blue Guide, and that's part of a an initiative called the, the New Legislative Framework, and they try to use words that are in the Blue Guide because these are words that where they they've looked at the case law and they've looked at how this word is used in various contexts and they can recommend uh, these words be, be used again just to, to in include or to in improve the consistency uh, from between legislation. So the word commercial is in there and that's the real reason, the main reason they want to use it. Now, it doesn't really apply very well to software. Like th this is taken from product legislation, which is mostly focused on physical products. And so in that context, the word commercial is getting more and more defined, but now it's being applied to, to software and it's it's a lot less clear. And it's it's not even just the word commercial, it's it's you know outside the course of a commercial activity. And, and then you're wondering, well, you know, if I'm paid a salary and I do this during my office hours, you know, is the software being distributed during the course of a commercial activity, even though maybe my employer has zero interest in the software. So it, it, there's, there's multiple things there, but the word commercial, yeah, they're, they're using it because it has a meaning in other contexts. Good, thank you. And I, yeah, please, I would encourage folks to put their questions in the chat. Some of the questions we may need to think about and come back later, so I'm, I'm kind of happy. Yeah, we're gonna up. save questions that don't get yeah. answered here so that we can answer them later. Yep. Uh, one question, um, Karen, I'm so glad you're on the call because we're really putting you on the spot. Um, the, uh, so additional EU legislation, is there any additional EU legislation you would like to cite that's coming down the road? Ooh, Just a uh, I only have a list. Uh, um, the AI Act and the Data Act are almost finished, but because they're blocked, they're all of a sudden they're open again, so things still might change there. Uh, next year, we're going to have the AI Liability Directive. There's a standard essential patents regulation, which is actually really interesting because there's good things in there, and so we would like to see that happen, that get finished. But you know, we're running out of time to, for that to be finished by the end of the year. Uh, there is, in parallel to the CRA, there's the, the Product Liability Directive, which is actually very similar in scope, and once again, it has the obligations triggered by supply, so it's similar again, but it gives you liability for any damage caused by your software. And the interesting thing here is that it doesn't require any fault on behalf of the supplier or the developer. You don't have to be negligent. It just has to be that your software caused somebody damage. And the damage can include things like data loss. So if somebody, if, if, if you have a buggy version and people start losing data, then uh, you could be liable for that according to the Product Liability Directive, which is happening in parallel. It's about a month or two months later than the, the CRA. Um, I, I guess that's, you know, there's, there's also, there's, there's actually a review of the Blue Guide and the, the NLF, the new legislative framework coming up. And so that's a bit for, it's, it's quite deeply legal, nerdy kind of topic, but uh, it's actually gonna be of, of very uh, serious consequences and it's an opportunity to get things right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different, that's, that's half my list. It's, that's the main ones. So there's a lot, yes, there's a lot. And this is where I think my comment was, one of the reasons we we're getting involved is because we see there's a growing interest in uh, the in the EU to uh, the, uh, write rules or update rules that will impact uh, open source. Question came in, and this is really for us. Give Kieran a break. What are the concrete next steps for the project representatives leading today's call? So let me share what I'm planning to do, and others weigh in. Um, so I'm in awareness mode with my community, with the Drupal community, especially my European members. Get the word out. Um, and then uh, Kieran uh, will be working with Open Forum Europe uh, to contribute however we can on the policy paper they're developing. And so if there are, as, as drafts are circulated or there are questions or need for input, um, I'll be reaching out to my community members to say, hey, here's, here's an issue, here's a question that is gonna be handled in the policy paper, what have you. Um, what's our position on, what do, what do we think about it? Um, so, um, and then, uh, and then, Lastly, supporting an in-person event that Crystal uh, mentioned in in, um, in Europe in September. That's not exactly sure the form or the date of that or, or the output, but uh, we'll be supporting that. So right now I'm kind of an awareness and 
opening the dialogue with my community so we can be quickly responsive. Crystal, Matthias, if you guys want to weigh in what you're doing. Yeah, what we're doing is pretty in line with what you said, um, making sure our community, uh, the, the Joomla community is aware of what the CRA is and how it could affect our contributors or the people who have built their livelihoods surrounding Joomla as a CMS um, and making sure that we are communicating uh, with our security team uh, to discuss what we are already doing and how the details of this act could affect us or the different versions of it, um, trying to narrow down some of the feedback that we might be able to give um, to, back to legislators to see what we can uh, we can advise on and try and communicate with our communities as well uh, through things like the survey that was shared earlier, um, possibly a different sur survey will come out. Uh, as well, that's going to be a little bit more generic for the uh, to to discuss what what makes a product, what makes a what makes a project commercial, um, and get our communities' perspectives on all of those things. Because ultimately, we are doing our best not just to represent our projects, but also to represent our communities and um, make sure that you are accounted for as well. Since this will also affect you. Yeah, and from the Type 3 community, we are doing a lot of the, the same things. We also have a, a little chat that we've opened up on, on talk.type3.org, uh, where we're asking some questions to, to community members. And, uh, well, feedback is, is very welcome there. And I, we're also doing a, a job to get this uh, message out. I think, uh, apart from from just focusing on the type of three association, I think all of you who who are listening to this, it is really important to make sure that type that that open source is understood uh, by legislators and well everyone in in Europe because it is really central to the European economy and to to our modern modern technology. So uh, this really shows that you know we have to go out there and talk about our. Uh, systems our projects but also this uh basic value system that we're working on that we actually don't learn in school and wordpress is doing all the same stuff we also have the community summit um coming up <laughs> where i imagine i will talk to a lot of our um our, our local community leaders about what they learned here and what questions they have as well. And I'll be able to keep everybody updated as we do that at the end of August. Thank you. So I think this webinar is less of a call to action, specific action that we're asking members to take right now, more awareness, stay tuned. Um, and so as we uh, reach out to you, we can get information, your feedback and input. Um, what I'd suggest is a couple more questions and then a uh, wrap, quick wrap up. Um, and uh, um, we'll talk about how we'll make this recording and and and, and uh, answer the questions and other things available after the call. Um, Kieran, back to you. I hope you had a nice break. Um, we had a question here about non-code contributions. And are they, is there any, would this cover non-code contributions uh, to open source projects? My thinking is no, but I'm not sure. I, I think I think that's safe. Yeah, I think I don't say I don't think non-code would be covered. So that that would be okay. Um, so there's a small thing I want to just mention. So the so just the interest of covering EU legislation even for outside the EU. So like between the US and the EU, the US is the the, the stronger you know, clearly. Uh, but the thing is because the US has a more uh, it's a slower policy on regulating. In, in the US, there's a tendency to let things progress and then you know jump in when they fall off the rails. And in the EU, the tendency is to make a framework early and then you know have progression happen within the framework. And there's, there's pluses and minuses for both. But it just means that in certain areas you know, where the US does regulate, the US tends to, to lead the world then. But whenever the US decides to not to regulate, then the EU is, is often there to, to jump in and start regulating. And so this can then have a, a, a run on effect on, on the US and in other parts of the world. And so this is also a reason why the, the CRA is of interest, I think, for 
for people all around the world. Great, thank you, thank you for that. And, and I would agree with that analysis of of uh, the import of this um, this rule uh, beyond the Europe beyond Europe. Uh, I think we had, we're at a minute to suggest a wrap up. Chris, I don't know if you want to wrap up or is there anything we want to say collectively? I think that there was one more question that would be good to address if we have okay. uh, if we have another minute or so because it affects specifically um, uh, people who build websites. So the question is, given all the product projects here are CMS systems, would the exception, the open source exception apply to people, including commercial entities who use these platforms to build websites, um, which is an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that because in I could totally see that uh, a website could be considered a digital product. But um, Kieran, I hope you don't mind if you if you have any insight on on how that might uh, apply. Oh, SAS exception, I'm sorry. Um, there was a software as a service exception that was uh, referenced. Yeah, indeed. So, so there's a SAS exception for software that's running on the server. Uh, there are still some questions about CMSs because, for example, when people are viewing a web page, it's going to have some JavaScript in the web page. And so it's not clear whether a web server supplying a web page to somebody with JavaScript is this also uh, supplying software? And you know, then if your web server site has any commercial aspects, then you have to wonder, am I within the course of a commercial activity or not? So the problem is that yeah, just a lot of the times when it's not certain, people will err on the side of caution, and this just causes a, a chilling effect in general. But there are a lot of these questions where the answer will, will be for a long time, yeah, we don't really know. Thank you. Hopefully it becomes clear as, uh, as we work through this. Um, we have still quite a few questions in the question answer box. I, we can't get to all of them, but we will collect them and do our best to address them after the webinar. Um, and we're not going to necessarily answer all of them because some of them is going to be, I don't know. Uh, but either way, we will do our very best. Uh, before we uh, log off, I just wanted to say thank you again to Matthias, to Tim, Josefa, Kieran for speaking today. You all have been wonderful to work with uh, in getting the letter together and in getting this uh, webinar together. And I'm very excited to continue working with you both for the CRA as well as other things in the future. Um, we had 500 people registered for this webinar, which is just so incredible to see such interest from across our, our different communities. Uh, we will be uh, publishing the recording of it, I believe, and uh, sending out the survey links that were mentioned earlier. So you will receive those in your email, so far as I understand it. Um, and thank you all for, for attending, uh, for taking the time to show up, especially those of you who are not in the EU. Uh, because I know that you are some some of you are attending in the middle of the night, uh, which is very inspiring. Thank you for your commitment and your interest. Yeah, uh, well done, all of you. And I, I think I, that was it. Did I miss anything? All good. Nope. I think you covered it. But special thanks goes to you, Crystal, for making the initial calls to each of us to pull us together on this. So, um, thank you uh, for doing that. It's my pleasure. I can't take any credit. It was a, a member, a couple members of my Joomla community that told me, hey, are we doing something about this? And it made me aware that we should be. So, well, then we'll pass the kudos down to our community members because I also had a couple community members who were like, are we doing things? <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks everyone for your yeah, time. Ultimately, today. it's all about the community, right? Exactly. exactly. That's why we're here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. everyone. Thanks a lot.